Hello, uh, good morning Cara Cooney. It's a pleasure to have you here at Meet the Archaeologist. Um, could you possibly just introduce yourself uh, to those who are watching? My name is Kathleen Cooney, but my mother hated the name Kathy, so she nicknamed me Kara in advance, so everybody calls me Kara Cooney. But academically, I publish under Kathleen Cooney, but my popular work I do under Kara Cooney, so I have two, two identities right off the bat. I teach at UCLA, uh -huh. um, University of California at Los Angeles. Um, I teach Egyptology um, of all different kinds and ancient history. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, um, obviously many people will know you in part, obviously, for your, for example, your, the work that you appeared in different capacities on TV. But could you possibly just talk a little bit about, I suppose, your, your passion in terms of, or your passions when it comes to Egyptology and archaeology? What, what really, what do you enjoy as an archaeologist? It's, it's, um, it's, this question is the question I'm asked the most mm -hmm. by the public, and it's also the question that archaeologists never ask each other because <laughs> they know that it's impossible to answer, and it's, um, it makes us uncomfortable because we don't know what to say. There's no, there's no good answer for this. It's like, why do you like ketchup? Why do you not like pizza? Why do you do what you do? It's, it's more emotional than you would think mm -hmm. because we're those stupid people who decided, most of us are, are those stupid people that fell in love with dinosaurs or ancient Egypt or archaeology and then never grew up and followed that, that passion to the nth degree. We're also all of us a little bit autistic in that we, <laughs> we just did, you know, put our blinders on and did that one thing. Um, and so it's, it's actually really, really hard to answer. And how do you tell somebody that you're in love with dead people? How do you do that? <laughs> it, there's, no, there's no way to make that something that a normal person can understand because that's what all archaeologists and, and ancient historians do is they spend their lives trying to crack the ancient system, trying to figure out what the ancient people did and how they thought, trying to get back as best we can in our little time machines to figure out what the ancient world was like and we are driven to do so for reasons that we ourselves do not understand. Um, I don't understand it, but I have to do it. And, yeah. um, and that's the best answer that I can, that I can give. No, wonderful, wonderful. I remember um, on the, uh, the common room when I was in uni, there was uh, a poster saying, archaeology, the only legal form of necrophilia. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that movie, that horrible, horrible, wonderful movie, Somewhere in Time, where Christopher Reeves falls in love with the, with the girl that died a hundred years ago and has to go back in time. Yeah. I remember I watched that when I was little, and I just thought, oh, if I could only do that, that would just be so fabulous. Yeah, so we all want to do that. But, yeah. but then graduate school kind of drives out the, the passion and the, and the romance and, and all of those emotional feelings. And I think it's easy then to become very clinical and very um, academic. Mm -hmm. conservative about how one approaches the field and that's why I try to keep my two schizophrenic selves going because the one feeds the other and um, and when I see what interests the public it helps bring me back to my original passion for, the, for my subject. Well <laughs> it's good to hear that, 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 uh, that you have a, a sort of a need in that sense to be uh, to be what you are and uh, I suppose um, how this ties in with uh, with various elements of your work. I imagine this is something that's going to interest various uh, archaeologists, especially out there. Do you ever find it hard, I suppose, to balance personal passions and drives with the rigours of academia and the requirements, of, in that sense, of the public? I mean, do you ever find it difficult to, to present archaeology in an accurate way? Well, well, always, and you know, that book that I just wrote, <clears throat> The Woman Who Would Be King, is a case in point, because, and I didn't write it for an academic audience, and I made, the name on it is Kara Cooney, and I, and I don't, I keep it as far away from academic um, centers as I possibly can, but the, the feedback I get is either, you know, the conjecture is over the top, this is crazy, and what is she thinking, and how does she think she can do that, even though I've given my reasons for doing it in the beginning of the book and the forward. And then the other side of the coin is the public who say to me flat out, couldn't you have gone further? Couldn't you have just fictionalized it? We really would have loved to have read that instead. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there's really no winning. And I'm not a fiction writer, and I wanted to experiment with that and push the envelope as much as I could. But there's, there's always going to be that, that balance between what is appropriately conservative academically and, and what do we really as people want to know. What I come down to is that 
Yeah, you can be, you can be, you can have your cake and eat it too. I don't think there's any problem with working with the data and only pushing the data so far, and yet realizing the whole time that we're dealing with ancient people mm -hmm. with emotions of love and fear and hatred and fears and anxiety and, and who do things because of those emotions. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that can ever be. We shouldn't forget that. That that um, that. I don't know, it sterilizes the ancient world and puts it into a glass case and puts it as an object in a museum mm -hmm. and removes us from that context. And I think the human context needs to go back. Mm -hmm. that, that's, so that's part of what I do. Okay, wonderful. And actually, in that sense, I, I, say I, I, do, I, I tend to err on that side of things, which I don't, I never, I've never particularly appreciated the way in which, for example, say children or play or whimsy, for example, is, is somehow removed from archaeological data sets. People tend to say, well, this has to have a purpose, for example, you know, uh, as opposed to, well, this, these are human beings and sometimes actually they're just, they can, for example, muck about, you know, that kind of thing. That, or that everything has to have a logical reason. Yeah. People are logical. I'm sorry, go out to the pub tonight and hang out with your friends and you find out how logical they <laughs> actually are. Things don't work according to logic. The way I like to think is things work according to systems. Yeah. And no one can do whatever they want and they're all a part of a system. What system was Hatshepsut a part of? What system are you a part of? What system was uh, prehistoric man or woman of Stonehenge a part of? Put it into that system and then you can conjecture, then you can get an idea of what they're capable of and within the, the parameters of those of those human emotions, mm. how far can they can they push their agenda and what they want? Mm. And I suppose also as well how they can use that system to express a counter cultural perspective as much as one which is compliant, as it were. Not everyone in the past was just an Egyptian. Some of them were, you know, a bit countercultural in that sense. There is, and that's so rare. When you find that countercultural expression, mm. it's um, it's something that archaeologists, Egyptologists, focus on. When really, that's that's such a rare thing to be able to step outside of the system, out of Bourdieu's habitus, if you if you want to get super academic, <laughs> and um, and and be able to express yourself beyond what is expected. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, when you see somebody like Sen and Moot producing statues that are that have never been seen before. Maybe that's not countercultural, but it's certainly pushing the boundaries of what culture expects. Mm -hmm. You know that he's special, that he's able to do things that other people aren't allowed to do, and that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe Bourdieu said, uh, Habitus is fate, not destiny. Uh, I think that's very apt, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, in that sense, actually, uh, this, this, this balance, I suppose, between uh, what is archaeologically observable and what we, as human beings, can empathise with from the past. Um, this seems to have come into sharp focus recently, for example, with you on social media when it comes to um, the, the Exodus film. Now, for my part, I'm actually a huge Ridley Scott fan, you know, from Alien all the way through. I love Gladiator. <laughs> when I taught Ancient Rome at, at Stanford, we watched that movie at the end of every quarter, and, it, and I loved it. Exactly, it exactly. And actually, I mean, for example, for example, in, in Gladiator, there's a moment at the beginning when uh, he is um, showing a, a siege between Romans and, and you know, Germanic tribes and there's actually a moment in the commentary where he talks about how archaeologists said, oh no, 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 if they're going to have ro uh, arrows on fire you need to have little terracotta pots, each one with a little bit of oil in it and then they'll dip them in the oil very carefully and then light them but he went, no, sod that, no, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to dig a trench and then fill that with oil, that's what you do in a battlefield now, I appreciated that pragmatism, I have to say, actually, even though obviously I'm an archaeologist, I go with the data. There's something about a pragmatic approach to the filmic pre presentation of the past, which I've, I have appreciated in his films. But, clearly, there is a line, and it seems that, for example, when it came to Exodus, uh, the, is it uh, Ramesses and the, the oh, headdress? Oh, they crossed that line. Yeah. They crossed that line. Yeah, he's wearing a vulture headdress. He's wearing a queen's headdress. You know, and let's, I haven't seen the movie because I, I have no time and I have a four-year-old and, ha and I'm going through a divorce and it's complicated and you can keep that if you want. <laughs> and, um, joyfully, joyfully moving forward, but life is complicated. So I haven't seen it, but my problem with the Exodus thing comes down to execution and preparation mm -hmm. because I work as a consultant a lot for a number of different projects. I'm in Los Angeles, so I'm easily found, right, as, as, a, as a consultant for these things. And um, I'm working on one show right now, and I'm not gonna say who it is, it doesn't really matter. But you know, I read the script, and it's like they want it to be Game of Thrones, and the guys are on their horses with swords, and they jump off the horse in ancient Egypt, and they fight with the swords, and I'm like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and have you not heard of a 
chariot and the other weapons and did you try it? Did you Google? Did you Google? You know, and it's just, it's the simplest thing, but people don't, they just have this Eurocentric view of the world. So that's one thing. And then the lack of preparation drives me crazy. I'll get a phone call, they're shooting out in the desert, somewhere in Africa right now. And I'll get a phone call at six in the morning from the desert. Kara, we've got the king in this headdress. Is it okay? And I have to say, well, what does it look like? Send me a picture. They send me a picture and I say, no, it's not okay. You just would have taken a, one picture before you made it with the, yeah. with the guy, with the costume designer guy. Yeah. And it just, and I've done TV work, right? I did Out of Egypt with Discovery and I've worked with crews and I've worked with um, producers and I know, I know that people like to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible and people don't like to do their homework. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm the same girl who loves the mummy, even though there's five canopic jars and there's yep. scarabs that eat people and there's, you know, but, and that's okay. It's supposed to be B-movie camp and that's what it set out to do from the beginning. And Stuart Tyson Smith consulted on that and that's fine, but no one's been able to do Egypt, serious Egypt, right. No. Because the only people who have maybe is um, Prince of Egypt, but I, the Jewish agenda freaks me out in that. Isn't it called Prince of Egypt, mm -hmm. um, the Steven Spielberg animated um, film? That, that worked out a little better. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen live action Egypt that's not meant to be campy be movie fun done right because people can't, they can't deal with the amount of study and research that they have to do and um, they're just, they're not willing to put in the prep and really work with an Egyptologist. And we would be willing to give them so much. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. authenticity is usually more interesting than the, the crap that they come up with. So, Well, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, um, one of my big bugbears in, um, uh, in British archaeology is the way that, for example, um, Stonehenge is used and abused. So a couple of years ago, and I've said this a couple of times on, on videos on my YouTube channel, but um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years ago, there was the presentation of, each, of, uh, of Stonehenge as being a complete mystery, you know? And uh, they went so far as to say, was it built by the devil, UFOs, ancient, uh, ancient Egyptians even? And um, there was no balance. And yet with other sciences, there's always a balance. So for example, with space science, when they present Mars, they may make the joke about little green men, but they'll roll out a space, uh, an astrophysicist to, to explain the latest science, the latest, latest good idea. And people seem to think that you can, you can take um, liberties with the past. I think that's, that's a, real, a real shame. I think actually, now I like, I've thought about this a lot, I'm an Egyptologist, I have to think about this a lot because everybody believes the pyramids are built by aliens and that's one of my constant battles on Facebook with, mm -hmm. you know, just fighting with otherwise reasonably intelligent adults who believe that the, that the aliens built, the aliens built the pyramids, right? Mm -hmm. It's a racist theory, it's an outlandish theory, there's all kinds of ways that I could go at it, but really the way that makes the most sense and what usually makes people go, oh, I haven't thought about it that way is that they're buying into the very ideology, and it doesn't matter what pyramid, if it's a, an Aztec pyramid, if it's a Mayan pyramid, an Egyptian pyramid, they're buying into that ideology that the man who built it wants you to buy into, which is that he is superhuman. He's above you, he's from the heavens, he is a god. He has done something that's so miraculous and amazing that it cannot be done by human hands. It is a goddamn miracle. Mm -hmm. And that thing in front of you, that, and if, if you stood in front of the pyramids, and I assume you have, you've stood in front of them, and it, you feel the miracle in your belly. It's a visceral feeling. It's emotional. And you cannot comprehend how it's possible for people to do that, to marsh, and you as an archaeologist may think, oh my God, I need to marshal all that labor, and how did they get the stones up, and isn't it inside out pyramid, or do they use ramps? And you're thinking, thinking, thinking. But the normal everyday person just stands in front of it and says, this is not possible. Mm. This is not possible to be done by human hands. Somebody else must have come in here and done that, and that is exactly, <laughs> exactly what those kings wanted you to believe. Yeah. So you're just, it's, it's still working today, which to me says more about the elegance and, uh, and cleverness of ancient political ideology than anything else, mm -hmm. because they knew how to prove it, mm -hmm. and they knew how to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And they abandoned things like First Dynasty sacrificial burials, too expensive, too cruel, let's get rid of that, and move on to monumental architecture of a type that you cannot freaking believe. <laughs> and I will show it to you again and again, and you will believe that me and my family and my lineage, that we are not as you. We are different. We are not just special. We are gods ourselves. And yeah. that's what I think is happening. And it's Stonehenge, same thing. 
Exactly, it almost works too darn well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, we, and you know, we have ways of doing this, but we have to really scramble to come up with something that is as good as what the ancients could do. We, we really have a hard time competing with that, which I find very interesting. Humanity is exposed. We, we take each other down with character assaults. There's very little otherworldly humanity out there that can do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. And we, we still find that very sexy and very appealing mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very unattainable, no matter how big a skyscraper we built or cool plane we can come up with. There's, it, it's very hard for one family, one man, one person to create that kind of power mm. anymore. Mm. So and that, yeah. that, that, that's possibly, I suppose, why, say, in the Bank of England or with the say the Capitol building in Washington, people hark back to Ionic and Corinthian um, uh, pillars. This kind of thing. everyone's looking back to the the, the ideas that really worked well, and um, we yet to come up with something that that, that can compete. <laughs> like, like, no, you know. we really haven't. I yeah. can't. I can't think of anything that can that can really compete. There are beautiful structures out there, but when you've seen the Parthenon. When you've seen the Great Pyramids, you can't compete with, with the perfection mm. of that antiquity mm. and uh, the care that, that ancient people were able to take, or I think more likely, the demands that that kind of power created and what people built to, to set up that kind of power visually. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now, well, that, that is, is fascinating, uh, that, um, actually. That's a, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And um, uh, we could go on for ages on that topic. But actually, what, what I want to do is, is just drag you back, I suppose, to, as an archaeologist, um, to I suppose, some of the questions which I tend to ask everyone in these interviews. Um, so I suppose the, uh, a biggie is what, for you, is the most satisfying thing about being an Egyptologist or an archaeologist? What, what, what do you really wake up in the morning and, and, and love about your, your career? It's more of a, um, well, I love it, but it, it, all, it's, it induces panic simultaneously. Um, and that is that Egypt is special. Egypt is different. You know, you go to a conference and you say, oh, yeah, but she's an Egyptologist. <laughs> we all know what that means. Mm -hmm. that we don't hang out with the other archaeologists. We don't use theory like you guys do. We're different. And that is, um, it continues to intrigue me, and that has its sources in Egypt's geography, I think. And Egypt being this protected place on four sides, deserts, cataracts, Mediterranean Sea, it could develop with a cultural continuity that arguably no place else on earth has. You go to Northwest Asia and Iraq and Syria and you watch the hordes and the ethnicities and the languages just competing and taking each other over and there's just no place for that kind of slow, elegant cultural development to occur. Mm -hmm. Go to Greece and democracy is one of the cruelest, especially ancient democracy, one of the cruelest political systems, very, very com competitive, very complicated. Look at the warlording in Rome. You know, all of these places disallow that kind of slow burn, that kind of same language, same religion, same political system for 3,000 years in one place, getting the chance to develop. Yeah. Ice and Egyptologists have to work with that long durée, all the way from the pre-dynastic and the craziness to the, the Greco-Roman time period. And that's where the anxiety comes in. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have the, the hordes and the invasions until until imperial um, times, until you get um, the Syrians, Persians, Alexander the Great, and the Romans in succession, right? You, you have this, you have all this stuff, you have all of these temples, you have people building on to temples and on and on, you have statuary after, st I mean, it's just, it's an embarrassment of riches because so little is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And again, look at Syria today and how much material culture is destroyed in their system, driven by that geography as part of that cultural or, ge or geographic determinism. And then compare Egypt and even the, 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 um, the, the, the recent uprisings in the Middle East, right? Egypt reacted differently from every other place. And in antiquity, it's always been different. Mm -hmm. And so that, that continues to intrigue me, but I also know that as an Egyptologist, I have to be able to date a 5th dynasty statue versus an 18th dynasty statue. And when the 18th, within the 18th dynasty statuary, I need to know which is Amenhotep III, which is Tutmos III. I better be able to tell the difference. What does Ramses II stuff look like? Where are the most important pieces in which museums? That gets really overwhelming. And I have to be honest, I have my thesis advisor is Betsy Bryan, who has this encyclopedic mind that knows everything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have an encyclopedic mind. I think more in big ideas and, and big systems, and that's where I seem to shine. 
and the deep, the data, I like dealing with data, but I'm that person that often works with it and then forgets it. And I have to relearn it and re-remember it and, and reuse that data. And my, my brain is more messy. So I've woken up in a panic many nights, <laughs> not, not able to remember where an object is or feeling like I'm stupid because I can't remember the, the you know, we're talking about 50,000 pieces of visual memory that a good Egyptologist needs to have at their disposal, at their, at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Egyptology to me, and, um, and to work with graduate students and try to get them to work through that anxiety and to figure out how their brains work and to work with that data, that's been pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, I really do like the grad seminars, and I don't run my grad seminars in an encyclopedic way. They're, they're very messy. I let the students bring as much as they can to the table. That means that sometimes when you have a good group of grad students, the seminars rock. Sometimes when the grad students are just a little waiting for you to feed them, a little more passive, they're not as good. No, no. But I kind of let that happen. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. It was a long answer to. <laughs> long answers are good. Long answers are good. Um, okay. Well, uh, in that sense, in that, in that sense, then, um, as specifically as an Egyptologist, then um, we'll we'll sort of move away from the archaeologist element there. What challenges do you think face Egyptology in, in the coming years? Uh, I mean, recently I was talking to, um, do you know Penny Wilson? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was talking to her and, and she had some very particular concerns about, for, for example, the state of, of, of the political and archaeological realms in Egypt at the moment. Um, what, 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 what do you think is on the horizon for Egypt, Egyptology? Oh, that's hard. Well, it depends on where you are. Mm. Um, there, all around the globe right now, there's an anti-intellectualism, anti-humanities movement, and Egyptology will be part of that. Um, the people that, that can often survive that anti-humanities movement in my country are often the people that work in minority fields who do Asian art, Africanness, something or other. Egyptology is still very much perceived in, in a, it is very much a colonial science. Hell, you go to Karnak, that's a French concession. You go to Medina and Habu, that's an American concession. How weird is that, that we actually still do that and it still works? Mm -hmm. Most of the Egyptology that occurs is European or American. It's not Egyptian. We don't publish in Arabic. All of it is as colonial as it could possibly be. And I do not see the Egyptian education system improving itself enough to rectify that mm. anytime soon, which is a tragedy, but that's the truth. Mm. Um, in my country, in the United States, Egyptology, I mean, we do it very differently from the UK in that we don't depend on majors. We don't depend on people specializing in our field, mm -hmm. undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And we depend on getting students into big classes. And that's usually where a department's going to get funds or money funneled towards Egyptology. So my, I teach a big class right now called Women in Power in the Ancient World. Egypt is a big part of that. Um, I teach, um, you know, Egyptian history, Egyptian culture classes. Those classes can pull in 200 students. And then that money comes to our department and we benefit. We do not need to make people into majors. We don't need that many Egyptology specialists in this world, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, arguably we do, but that's a different cultural question for a different day. It's not sustainable economically, let's put it that way, with the systems that we have. Um, in the UK, it seems to me that, that the universities need these majors. And so they're driven to get students to specialize. And that, I think, is a, is a very dangerous thing for the student and for the university. It's, a, it's not sustainable. Mm. Um, I think there has to be a different economic model put in place for, to, to, to continue that. Um, nobody needs 80 MA Egyptology students at the University of Liverpool. I think that's insane. I think it's crazy, mm -hmm. but that's just me. In the United States, there are grad students at UCLA, and we have more grad students, I think, than, than any other Egyptology institution at any one time, and I think we have 15 between the Coates and Archaeological Institute and Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, and they're all getting PhDs. There's no MA, um, no one's gonna stop at an MA where it's either all or nothing with us. Um, about 50% of those students finish, and that's as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in terms of the education, I think we need to make Egyptology about humanities and our teaching about general humanities, teaching a student how to think, how to read, how to work critically, how to work with data, whether they're gonna go to be an engineer or it doesn't matter, they still need to learn to write. And that's where I come in as an Egyptologist. Most of my teaching is using Egypt and its sexiness, because it is so sexy, to <laughs> teach the undergraduate how to read and think and write and all of those things that they need to learn how to do. And then for the very, very small minority 
of students who are crazy like me to come in and work with me as a grad student. And that's the way I think it's more sustainable. I think that'll work. And I think that's why Egyptology is, is doing well in the United States. It's mm -hmm. okay. Um, Egyptologists are getting positions in ancient history departments or, or history departments as ancient historians, classics departments, the, the art history departments. It is possible. Um, you don't have to be an Egyptologist. Um, and now you asked about Egypt and politics and whether or not that's sustainable. I don't know, but, but I get very apocalyptic when I think about the whole world. Remember, I live in Los Angeles, and we're in a severe drought, the worst drought we've ever seen, four-year drought so mm -hmm. far. It's not going to turn around anytime soon. There's no snowpack because when it rains, it's too hot for any snow. And we're talking about an urban landscape with 20 million people with no water. That's my, and I listen to it on the radio every day, that's my daily reality. That's very interesting to me. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think about what that means in terms of sustainability and what systems will collapse and what and how human systems collapse. Egyptian systems are also on a precipice of collapse, just like a lot of other places around the globe. There's mm -hmm. too many people, there's not enough resources, we're all dealing with this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that's like, yes, we must save Egyptology and monuments are important and the Cairo Museum and all of this. But the, the more I work, and the more I read, and the more I think, and the more I teach, the more I try to make my ancient Egyptian studies as humanistically driven as possible so that we can solve maybe, maybe, some of these larger problems that are looming over all of humanity. And um, yeah, that, so I got pretty, I got pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true, it's true. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've long believed that, that archaeology has an awful lot to offer the modern world in, in, in tackling some of these modern issues. And as you say, for example, modern environmental concerns, we've got 200,000 years or more of, of really good environmental models. That's just environment. You know, when it comes to social problems and so on and so forth, there's so much that we can offer. Um, and perhaps, as you say, taking a humanities-driven approach is is an answer to, to making archaeology both relevant in terms of, you know, to getting funding, but also actually, you know, stop it. Uh, I've once had someone say archaeology is just navel gazing, and that's that's actually that's that's the that's the quickest way to combat that is to say, well, actually, no, we're, we're tackling problems which are very very relevant. Um, we're, and we're gazing at everybody, all of humanity's navels, and do you want those navels to continue to be produced or not? Because it's yeah, I mean, it is all about humanity, and that's that's the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean. My, my long-term work is um, Bronze Age Collapse, mm -hmm. and I go at it in a very specific way. So I look at 21st Dynasty coffins, and I look for reuse of mm -hmm. these coffins. And I'm going to museum after museum. I've been to London, Paris, Rome, Turin, Vienna, Edinburgh, Brussels, tons of collections, right? And I go into their storage, and I work with their coffins. I photograph them, I document them, and I crawl around with a flashlight mm -hmm. and infrared and all kinds of fun things, some UV light, special glasses, and look for reuse. And I've documented reuse with just my own two eyes and a flashlight mm -hmm. and sometimes some, some UV light on over 50% of these coffins. That's just what I can see. I'm sure that if I had the ability to look underneath the plaster, and that's tricky, I'd be able to document a lot more. But so here's one little, there's a lot of data, right? We're talking about 800 coffins, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And a time period of intense collapse when the Sea Peoples are sweeping around the Mediterranean, Mycenaeans fall, Hittites fall, Ugarit falls, they go into Egypt. The north of Egypt is devastated. Memphis and Heliopolis are no more. There are no elites. There's no system. The systems and the governments have absolutely failed. The only thing that's still working is this Theban mafia of high priests. And the Sea Peoples are on their doorstep. The Libyans are coming in. There's invasions. There's civil war. It's crazy. And what do people do? when they're faced with a choice about their religious beliefs. If they've grown up believing that they need materiality to transform themselves into Osiris, and yet they cannot get that materiality because the trade routes have shut down, because there's no wood, because the wood is being used for martial purposes and warfare, do they then decide, oh, we don't need coffins, it's gonna be fine, let's just enter ourselves into Osiris's arms. No, people don't do that. People continue to follow the same cultural ways even when it's environmentally devastating, even when there's no economic way to sustain it. And so what do they do? They reuse the coffins of their ancestors or their family members. They find clever adaptations. They form rent-a-coffin kind of systems where I can see that they varnish over the space for the name where they can write in the name and then they'll just wipe that down, use it for somebody else. And mm -hmm. it's kind of the wipey board hypothesis of coffin reuse. Mm -hmm. and. That's what people do. And my insight is just one small 
one small little glimpse into what people do when they're faced with crisis and scarcity. They usually do the same freaking thing they did before, a little bit different with some adaptations. That's dangerous. We are the only, the only organism that can see our own destruction coming. And individually, we can understand it. And yet, as a species, as a, as a giant super organism, can do nothing about it. No. Because that's just the way social inequality works. That's just the way economic systems of growth are. We are unsustainable. Mm -hmm. We always collapse. And to see that happening again and again, and to see the way people react within those collapses, is intensely interesting and maybe at some point useful and something that we could, we could work with. Indeed, hopefully one day we'll catch on, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, well, okay, just, a, just a couple more questions. Um, I suppose uh, it would be remiss of me uh, doing what I do and knowing what an awful lot of the stuff that you do not to ask you about, I suppose, the public face of archaeology. Um, how important do you think it is for archaeologists to actually take control of, for want of a better word, the message? I mean, we talked a little bit, a bit before about how, say, news media and film overtakes what archaeologists do and make us, makes assumptions for the public on their behalf about what we do. Um, what, how, how important do you think it is actually to get out there and get, get your hands dirty in that sense? Actually, grasp it. Well, you know what I'm going to say, you know that I think it's <laughs> because you know that I have this Facebook page with, I think, 40, almost 48,000 followers, mm -hmm. which is insane and not something I ever expected to be part of my career. Now I wake up and I'm like, oh, got to put something on the public Facebook. And I treat it as part of my job. Mm -hmm. And I treat it as part of my job to be lighthearted about it, to be funny, to not slam people with too much information, to, to put stuff out there and that's human and interesting and, um, competes with that media message of mystery and magic and the ancient people were different from you and aliens built the pyramids and I'll and, and religion remember where I, I grew up in Texas okay mm -hmm. so so I have to combat that severe anti-intellectualism that the earth is only 6,000 years old and there's no evolution and all of this crazy BS that I cannot believe people but anyway, so <laughs> and I go out there and I and I do it. So two of the battles that I that I actually openly fight are the alien pyramid battle, and the other is the anti-creationist battle. And I've been more political about it lately than I ever have before. And um, and it's it's interesting. I, I I like going out there and and doing that. And I I guess the third front that I'm on is kind of a feminist archaeology sort of front, you know, the woman and female power and how they have none and what does that mean? What is a patriarchal society? How does this work? And it's interesting to try to, you know, I'm an educator. That's my main, that's my main purpose in life. I, I do classroom lectures for freshmen and sophomore United States undergraduate students and I work with graduate students a lot. But that Facebook page for me is also education. Mm -hmm. And I'm educating a lot of adults, a lot of 50 year old men who watch Discovery Channel, and I'm doing it in, in tiny little pithy um, sentences that I connect to something, to some link that they can choose to read or not. I do a lot of cartoons. And, um, and I just try to make it something that, that, that brings people into the ancient world and makes the ancient world, this is my thing, I like to make the, the antiquity as applicable as it possibly can be because hell yes, we have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. And we've seen as archeologists, the collapse and the rise and the collapse and the rise. And what can I then communicate to people about what's, what's yet to come? We have no idea how big a collapse is yet to come. <laughs> and I remember I, I did a, a news interview with, and I think it was Oklahoma. And I was in this dark room and I'm, I'm remotely connecting to this interview in Oklahoma. And, um, and they're all, you know, makeup and all with a tie and all dressed up. And so, Dr. Cooney, and you really think that there actually will be a collapse of this civilization? And I said, of course there will be. Everything collapses. Every human system collapses. There's no way to get out of this one. You think you're going to die one day? And the guy, <laughs> like, no one gets to escape this. <laughs> and he looked at me shocked and appalled and said, and go off to a commercial break. And it was really funny. But I like to go there. I like to talk about um, death. Mm -hmm. I like to talk about sex. I like to talk about those human things that, and through that ancient lens, I think I can, I can get at some of those issues. So in the end, I guess I'm just an anthropologist. I just like people. And I just, I like to crack, you know, what it is that we're doing and, and what systems we've built and, and try to see through the veil mm -hmm. a little bit 
Um, so that's that's my agenda to get people to think a little bit, and it's fun. Yeah. yeah. So and we have to we have to take on that that messaging in whatever way that we can, and people are freaking hungry for it and they want to read that stuff and they want to know what I think about this or that. Dr. Cooney, what do you think? Or Kara, if you want, it's fine. What do you think about this or that? They want to know what I think. Mm. They want to know what the expert thinks. We need to get out and have that conversation with people and not be afraid to do it and not be afraid what my colleagues at UCLA are going to say. No. They don't care. They really don't. And, no. and the people higher up at UCLA, they love it. I think it's great. Exactly, and I have to ask you. Recently, um, we've been having more and more conversations with uh, you know people, for example, TV execs who say, "What would make a good TV program?" And they say, "We're sensing that maybe Ancient Aliens isn't the way to go." And you go, "No, sh Sherlock." <laughs> and, um, but actually, but the fact that the ability, the fact that actually the ability, uh, there's so much more easy now for archaeologists to actually take control of that stuff. Uh, I think is so important, and and. Well it should be. Well, and you know I, I produced a television show yeah. to do this. I yeah. did a six-part television show on Discovery called Out of Egypt. Blood, sweat, and tears. The amount of work I put into that show to do it right was insane. And I don't want to do that again no. because I'm not going to fight that machine. Mm. And I don't need to be on TV that much. So now I'm going to do books instead. There's many outlets for, mm. for the academic to, to choose to be able to be in the public eye. It is a shame that the the History Channel, Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, even BBC to some extent, pushes this this agenda that, that I don't like. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, I think it could change now that we have things like Netflix where you can go directly to the to the production mm -hmm. and raise your own money. But that, and then maybe we'll demand, and this is an interesting thing, that people get a PhD and then they go into media instead of into university stuff, or maybe the universities will create a media outlet. We definitely have that going at UCLA. This is California, come mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. they, they know that they need to have those, those media outlets. If I went to my dean and I brought in some higher ups and said, look, I wanna bring UCLA into some high level TV project and could I do this with your support? Could, would you consider it education? How would we work out my salary and figure all of this out? I bet I would have interested people. Yeah, yeah. I bet it could happen mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, and I haven't done anything like that. Again, I have the four-year-old and I'm too busy doing what I'm doing. And and it's possible. But then I think to myself, well, now I'm 42. When I did that TV show, I was in my late 30s. Mary Beard is a wonder and that's great. But do people really want to watch an older woman on TV? I don't know. Oh, but, no, 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 no. I mean, well, that, that, actually, that, that is interesting because you never really hear... Uh, sorry to cut you off there, but you never really hear uh, uh, old, ugly blokes get criticised like that, do you? Never! You know, exactly. Ever. exactly. The, and Mary has to take all of that because she's a woman and yeah. that's the only reason. Yeah. And some guy, some guy the same age has a shock of white hair and doesn't comb it and has eyebrows, boom, boom, and every, yeah. no one's going to say it, like but, yeah. but yeah. she does. It. And it's, it's the same with female politicians, it's the same with teaching, it's the same, same, same. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, uh, uh, again, a, a, one really interesting answer there. Um, I suppose finally, the final question that I'll that I'll take up your time with is: Do you have any, or rather, if you had any, what advice would you give to an aspiring, let's say, Egyptologist? Let, let's not talk about archaeology. Egyptologist. What 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 would you say to someone who goes, "I like the mummy." Incidentally, my wife loves the first two. The third one, she can you know, that, yeah, 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 that with just, her. didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, <laughs> But if, if they love oh, that film. Tell her I got to meet Brendan Fraser and he's very nice. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, no, I won't tell her that. No, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, these people who, who, who love that, that element of it and want to take, want to take it to the next step, what, what would you say to those people? Yeah, this is, this is tricky and you can imagine I deal with this question every day, all the time. I have office hours, students come in, I love Egypt. And I say, what's your GPA? Yeah. <laughs> Great point average. What is it? And if I hear something that's too low, I say then you can't you can't do this because here's the hard part is you we, you can only do this thing this strange thing where you you become an archaeologist and focus on dead people and teach if you if you have the brain and the ability to do it and and not everyone is cut out to be an academic. It's an intensely difficult thing to do. You have to you have to be able to process and analyze and come up with creative ideas and work with other people and but you need to be able to read when you're in a, a grad student two books a day and you need to be able to write and rewrite and figure out what you're I mean this is not something that most people are capable of mm -hmm. most of the students who come and talk to me don't have the chops 
to do it, mm -hmm. right? And you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so you just suss it out. You're like, okay, what are your scores? What are your great? You know, we get probably 60 applications for Egyptology grad school at UCLA every year. And I just look at the GPA, I look at the grade scores. I can toss out. 80% of the applications like that, just mm -hmm. by looking at those scores and knowing what they were able to do as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. If I see one B in any archeology span class or any Egyptology class, they're done. I'm not, I can't move on with that. That's pretty intense, but it's true. Mm -hmm. You need to be, you need to be killer. You need to have a 4.0, as we would say in the United States, perfect GPA. You need a really high juries. You need to be able to bring it. Mm -hmm. And if you have those things, then you need to realize that all throughout grad school, you need to have a plan B, that you need to have something on the side if and when, if and when, because I've had to do many side jobs while I was waiting for my dream job at UCLA. It, it doesn't just happen. If and when the Egyptology thing doesn't work out, what are you going to do in addition? What's your practical side? What are you going to do to take care of yourself while you're writing the book on the side, while you're applying for the tenure track job? So make sure you have something else. And for all of those other people that don't have the academic ability, don't feel ashamed. It's not a bad thing that you don't want to sit on your ass and read 18 books a week. This is not a problem. It's okay. Kill it in your career and then find a way to be a donor who gives back to ancient Egyptian work so, or, or, or archaeological work. And that's what I tell a lot of people who come to me when they're in their late 20s or their 30s. And they say, I love Egypt. I'm an accountant and I do this. I want to quit. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't quit <laughs> your day job. Do as well as you can in that career. Say yes to all of the opportunities that you're offered in that career. Make a lot of money. Do very well. Save some of that money. Save $5,000 of that money. Go to an archaeologist and say, hey, I would like to help fund your, your dig. Could I be a part of it and, and come along? We can do that in the United States. I don't know in the UK if it's a little bit different, but we have more informal uh, patterns and systems of patronage, you know, in the Howard Carter days of old. Yeah. And, and you can do stuff like that. So then you want to help fund somebody and help, then you're going to be really hands-on if you're able to help pay for that yeah. kind of work. We don't get, we don't have government money to support this work. We have to beg, borrow, and steal and scramble. You guys have to beg, borrow, and steal more in the UK than we do in the United States. We have a hell of a lot more research funds available to us than you do. Mm -hmm. So, and we also in the United States have more of a, a culture of giving and a culture of, um, of giving to universities, of, of giving to nonprofits, and archaeologists can fall into that. So if you create your own nonprofit and you can accept um, donations, and if that person who's giving can be a part of it, that's a way that I, I think people can can become involved, can volunteer. Um, like I said, the, the students that come into UCLA, and these are the top of the top of the top, half of them finish. Yeah. And that's probably as it should be mm -hmm. because the system isn't sustainable to get all of these people jobs. And I would hate to do the disservice of training so many grad students who then go out there without other skills. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, have to say that's probably one of the harshest answers that we've ever heard. Isn't but, it? But no, it's but horrible. no, but it, it, it's good. It's a good answer. That, and, and absolutely, you're right. And and uh, they tell them to follow their dream and to you know. Yeah. Exactly. Work yeah. Hard and study. <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, no. my poor son, I told him the other day, I said, you know when people tell you you can do whatever you want, it's such a lie. No one can do whatever they want, and I hate that. So let's figure out what you can do, and let's let's kill it, but no one, I, I, ah, no, I, I like reality. No. I like reality, I like the truth. Absolutely, so. absolutely, no, I, I completely agree. Um, and, uh, yeah, but a brilliant answer, thank you very much, thank you. Um, well, um, I suppose, uh, we'll, we'll, I suppose we'll wrap it up there. We, we've taken up an awful lot of your time uh, this, this morning, but thank you so much for, for, for turning up. Um, is there anything finally that you'd just like to, for, to briefly say, like a, like a little sort of caption on, um, on Egyptology? What, what would you like people to know that they don't otherwise know? Oh, about Egyptology? I think we could outdrink some archaeologists. I don't know. Oh. What do you think? <laughs> oh, it's on. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, on that, on that bombshell, I'll, I'll leave it there. But thank you so much again. It's been a pleasure. Um, and, uh, well, hopefully um, you get some interesting, uh, interesting feedback on the drinking issue. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I'm trying so hard to get on drunk history. I'm just lobbying for so much. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can. Every time I'm just drunk history. You put me on drunk history. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Take care.